Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Big Daddy Top Hat here. Over the last few weeks, we have taken an in-depth look at some of the biggest beat-em-ups in history. All in all, those videos seem to have been well received. So, I ran a community poll containing a list of games for me to cover with beat-em-up elements contained within them. Obviously, this was to see what you, the audience, would like to see on here next. I have to say, I was very sad to see the CDI classic Mutant Rampage Body Slam only received 4% of the votes. What was that all about? But results are results, and Comic Zone edged out Double Dragon at the top of the poll, meaning we are going to take a deep dive look at that game today. I have to say, this result came as no shock to me at all, as I am fully aware of the cult following this game seems to have garnered over time. So today we are going to discuss why this game has got so popular, look at its gameplay, history and everything else that makes this game great. This ladies and gentlemen is the mad story of Comic Zone and why it is so important. Yeah. The Sega Mega Drive today is remembered as one of the greatest and most influential game consoles of all time with a library of games that is one of the strongest lineups in history. There were many elements that contributed to the creation of such a vast array of classics, but one piece of the puzzle that is perhaps undercredited somewhat on the Information Superhighway is Sega's Technical Institute. The Sega Technical Institute played a key role in many of Sega's successes. The Institute was a magical place in the 90s where Japanese and Western developers could work together and create imaginative games. Surprisingly, often rather experimentally, with little interference from management. Creators were simply given a space to be, well, creative. A lot of big names within game development would spend time working here. This would include Sonic the Hedgehog creator Yuji Naka, Marble Madness co-programmer Mark Cerny, who also worked on Sonic the Hedgehog 2, and Stige Hedlund, who would go on to participate in the design of both StarCraft and the Diablo series. It is reported that this institute came into existence as a result of a pitch by Mike Cerny to Sega, with the purpose of exposing Japanese teams to Western culture and their gaming values. Amongst this workforce was a designer known as Peter Morrowick, a young man who found employment with Sega at the age of 22. After pestering Marble Madness's Mark Cerny for a year, Peter would commence employment in March of 1992 and would start out by holding the position within Coinop Research and Development. The first project in which Peter would hold a major role in though would be with the release of Sonic Spinball, which was first released in North America and Europe in November of 1993. The game was developed by the American staff of Sega's Technical Institute, as the Japanese staff were occupied with developing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Sonic and Knuckles. In terms of Sonic Spinball, Morrowick featured as one of the game's lead designers. The game was inspired by Pinball Dreams on the Amiga, but Sonic Spinball received mixed reviews, with critics praising the novelty and the graphics, but criticising the controls. In regards to this, Morrowick had gone on record to state, Sonic Spinball was intended as a stopgap product, when it became clear that Naka wouldn't be able to deliver Sonic 3 for Christmas. Looking back, I wish we incorporated a bit more platforming, kept the art more consistent with Sonic's universe and made it easier. But considering what we had to work with, I think the game holds up well. It was the first major departure from traditional Sonic gameplay, so it's not surprising that some fans and reviewers didn't like it. Nonetheless, it sold extremely well and I'm grateful for being able to work on it. Spinball was my first full project, so it's very special to me. It is arguable that Morrowick's crowning achievement whilst working with Sega was yet to come, with of course the release of Comic Zone in 1995. What may come as a surprise to some though was that this title was conceptualised many years earlier, even prior to when Morrowick began work on Sonic Spinball. It turns out that many employees working at the Sega Technical Institute were massive comic book fans and as a result Morrowick would tag along with his co-workers to visit comic book shops in the local area. 
this experience would partially result in the inspiration behind Comic Zone, as Morrowind had the epiphany that comics and games could be very complementary to one another. This would result in the designer creating a demo animation of his conceptualised design using his Amiga. By this point in time, Mike Cerny had moved on from Sega and had been replaced with former Disney executive Roger Hector. Both Roger and Sega of America president Tom Kalinske were both very impressed with the demo and the game's potential. For a while though, Comic Zone ended up being put on hold, or in Morrowick's mind, at the time, cancelled altogether. This was in favour of the Spinball project, however, after Spinball's completion, the Institute would present games to management once again. This would include a re-showing of Comic Zone. On this day, Tom Kalinske would instantly greenlight the production of the title, remembering what a strong concept the title was. Before the game arrived on the Mega Drive, the game's original concept varied from the finished product in many ways, starting out with the game's main protagonist himself, who was named Joe Pencil. Joe Pencil was your stereotypical comic book reader of the period, thin and pretty geeky looking. Morrowick appreciated the superhero trope of scrawny kid transforming into a superhero much like Peter Parker and Spider-Man. But, being the mid-90s, this was a period in time where American companies were even giving action figures of characters like Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker bloody six-packs and broad shoulders for no reason. So, to put it nicely, Sega of America felt Joe Pencil needed to be addressed. In other words, redrawn again, as if he was pumped full of steroids because, well, 90s America, I suppose. Joe would be re-sketched as Sketch Turner, a character who no longer looked like a pencil neck geek, and instead just like a friend of mine, a regular opponent from the British wrestling circuit, a guy known as Brett for Craft Meadows, who by the way is not pumped with steroids, but just happens to be a very large man. Sketch Turner's new design was partially inspired by Morrowick's love for the Smashing Pumpkins and other grunge rock, so redesigned Joe in the vein of a tough grunge rocker. In terms of stereotypes of the time, Sega of America wanted Morrowick to design Sketch a sidekick, as it seemed to work well for Batman and Robin, and Sega had found success in the formula with Sonic and Tails. Morrowick thought the concept of an extra NPC following Sketch around with no real benefit to the gameplay was a complete waste of time, so instead managed to create a rat named Roadkill. On the subject of this small mammal, Morrowick is quoted to have said, the idea in Sega wasn't very popular initially, but I thought a pet rat made a good fit for Sketch. Didn't take up a lot of screen space, and we could do quite a bit with it in terms of puzzles and such. I still think Roadkill is one of the coolest video game sidekicks ever. So Comic Zone itself would finally hit shelves in August of 1995, making it one of the late games within the Sega Mega Drive's lifespan. As you know, the title is a beat-em-up platforming game which was both developed and published directly by Sega. As illustrated throughout this video, the title features the interesting artistic and mechanical choice of being set within the panels of a comic book. This leads to character dialogue in the game being rendered within text bubbles. All backgrounds and sprites within this game feature bright colours and a dynamic drawing style, all of course inspired directly by superhero comic books. Also as covered, you play the game as Sketch Turner, who in this game is apparently a starving artist and freelance rock musician who lives in New York City. In the game's story, Sketch is working on a comic book, known as Comic Zone of course. On one faithful evening, Sketch is working on his literature, and during a thunderstorm, a lightning bolt strikes a panel of his comic. This allows the comic's main villain, a mutant named Mortis, to be able to escape the confines of the artwork. He has a desire to kill Sketch, in order to become real flesh and blood and take over the real world. Unfortunately for Mortis, he does not have the power to achieve this, but does have the power to send Sketch to the comic book world, where his powers are much more effective. Essentially, this is where the fun begins, as once Sketch is in the comic book, Mortis can draw enemies at will in an attempt to defeat Sketch and take his life. In this comic book world, Sketch meets a character known as Eliza, who believes he is the chosen one who came to save their post-apocalyptic world from Mortis and his forces. 
completely ignoring Sketch's protests, Eliza sends him on a mission, keeping in touch with instructions and hints via radio. It is up to Sketch to stop Mortis's evil plans and find a way out of this comic book world. Now, I guess, really, this is where I should be talking about gameplay. Within this action platforming beat em up game with puzzle elements, the player progresses from panel to panel of the game's comic book setting. You play through a number of different environments, which we shall get to discussing in a little more detail shortly. The game features some pretty standard combat mechanics, with punching, kicking, and jumping attacks all being possible. Sketch can also tear off the backdrops into a paper plane to frighten enemies, but this costs health and can also hurt Sketch if he's not careful. In addition to this, Sketch can also collect and store up to three items within his inventory, which are used for puzzle solving and overcoming the game's obstacles. Items include the likes of bombs and knives for this purpose, as well as additional items simply to restore Sketch's health. Whilst we mentioned that the game features no skinny teens transforming into muscular superheroes, the already muscular powerful Sketch can transform anyway regardless. This is achieved by picking up a fist item, transforming him into Super Sketch. This transformation allows Sketch to perform a powerful attack that affects all the enemies on screen, kind of like when you use magic in Golden Axe. As mentioned earlier, Sketch also has a pet rat named Roadkill who follows him around the game. Roadkill can discover hidden items and help out when accessing areas Sketch is unable to get to on his own. Speaking of secrets, each level consists of two pages, and secrets can be found within them by shredding through the paper, revealing additional items. Making progress from page to page throughout this game is achieved either by solving the puzzles presented in front of you, or simply by defeating all of the enemies on the screen, like you would do in a classic style beat em up. Once again, in a traditional fashion, arrows appear on the screen indicating when you can progress to another panel. However, sometimes multiple arrows appear on screen at once, offering multiple routes throughout the stage, in turn offering an extra layer of replayability. Speaking of this game's replayability, if you hope to play through it, you are going to have to play it a hell of a lot, as Comic Zone is notoriously difficult. For this reason, Comic Zone will automatically not be everyone's cup of tea, as the difficulty is known to put some players off. If you are patient though, and can persevere with this game, each stage offers a different environment unique from the next, which helps keep this game fresh and interesting. Early in the game, you find yourselves wading your way through sewers, a segment of the game that looks likely to have been inspired by the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, a superhero franchise that had seen huge levels of success all over the world, not that long before this game's release. So the influence of some of the artistic choices are not surprising really. In regards to this, it would not surprise me if the existence of Roadkill was partly inspired by Splinter either. In fact, throughout the game there are ninjas, mutants and sewer-like waterways all over the place. It would be almost silly not to acknowledge the influence that Turtles has seemed to have had on this title. As you progress from level to level, you find yourself fighting through the pages of various beautiful stages. Environments seem inspired from Japanese and Western culture alike, which comes as no shock considering that Morrowick worked at the Multicultural Sega Technical Institute. Stages vary, bringing the player through deserts, snowscapes, caves, and many of the other environments you traditionally find yourself within in many games. But despite this, it is Comic Zone's unique art style that makes each of these stages stand out, even though in some ways we are treading such familiar ground. The whole game is just so beautiful looking, but at the same time, still very grungy. The bright, vivid colours make many elements of the game jump out of the screen. The title truly does present a unique gaming affair. If you're amongst the gaming elite who can beat this game, the title actually offers two possible endings. The end of the game sees Eliza attempt to defuse a nuke that Mortis and the mutants plan on using to wipe out humanity. But when Mortis comes back into the comic and throws her into the chamber, it starts to fill up with liquid. Mortis then battles Sketch personally. If the player defeats Mortis and the enemies he summons in quick fashion, enough to drain the liquid and save Eliza before the nuke self-destructs, an ending occurs where Eliza comes to the real world with Sketch and Roadkill and joins the army, eventually becoming Chief of Security for the United States. Roadkill is given a vast amount of mozzarella cheese and spends a lot of time exploring the city's new sewer system, 
when not sleeping under a pile of Sketch's dirty socks. As for Comic Zone, it becomes a sensation overnight, selling out on the first day, making Sketch famous as it becomes the best selling comic book ever. But a bad ending occurs if the player defeats Mortis after the chamber fills with liquid. Eliza dies as the nuke self destructs afterwards. Sketch and Roadkill come out, but Sketch's comic book is destroyed, leaving him devastated as having saved the comic world but failed to save Eliza. The last sentence in the cutscene says, Will Sketch unleash the evil once again to relive his adventure in the hope of a better ending? Happy sketching! On release, the game would be reviewed by various publications. This would include Famicom Tushin, giving the game a 30 out of 40. Game Pro considered the game's visuals a successful recreation of the look and feel of a comic book, but felt that the game quickly sours once the player encounters the repetitive combat and overly simplistic puzzles. They also stated Sketch can't move rapidly around the panel and button slamming yields unpredictable results. Electronic Gaming Monthly also gave the game coverage, also criticising the game's controls but acknowledging how bright and colourful the game looked, and also praising the game's originality and design. Next Generation stated that Comic Zone was a very cool idea for a game that wasn't executed properly, but Comic Zone is still better than most. As mentioned at the beginning of the video, Comic Zone is one of those titles that seems to have become more and more popular as the years have passed by. The game has continued to find an audience as it has been placed amongst countless Mega Drive compilation collections published across every system that has been released in the last decade. Also, when you take into account that brands like Marvel and DC are more popular and mainstream than ever before, Comic Zone now has an even cooler edge than it initially had on release. Many would miss out at the time on this game too, as some players had already moved on to the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation prior to this game's late release. So there are a number of factors why more people picked up this game at a much later date than 1995. All in all though, the game's unique art style and charm make Comic Zone a beloved game today, and many will sweep the title's flaws under the rug as a result. The game is artistically one of the most interesting games to play from the entire 16-bit era, making the title rather special indeed. Aside from the game's multiple re-releases as part of compilation discs, the game would appear standalone elsewhere including a DOS port, a Wii port and a not too clever Game Boy Advance port. As for Peter Morrowick himself, after Comic Zone he was tasked with helping design a Sonic game for the Saturn that never saw the light of day. This was a completely separate game from the cancelled Sonic Extreme, but Naka didn't approve this one either. Amongst all of this, Morrowick would also produce some concept art for a 3D sequel to Comic Zone, but sadly, this was never approved by Sega either. By 1997, Morrowick and Sega would have parted ways, and the man would go on to co-found a development house known as Luxoflux in January of that year. They would be responsible for developing games such as the True Crime series and Star Wars Demolition. However, the real crown in the man's career will always be Comic Zone, in my opinion. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the mad story of Comic Zone and why this little game was so important. Let me know in the comments section what you think of this game and why not share some of your experiences with the title down below. If you enjoyed today's content, do not forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell to ensure you get multiple videos like this on gaming history delivered straight to your multimedia device every week. I appreciate every view I receive. Lastly, my channel is partially funded by the generous donations I receive via Patreon. Patrons can earn a credit and a shout out at the end of these videos. These people make working full time on YouTube just that little bit easier, so I'd like to thank you all very much for that. Huge shout outs go out to Sebastian Veles, Carl Johnson, JD Robbins, Sin Spaces, Andrew Bazansky, Asobi Quan DX, Michael Baker, Tom Elliott, Computer Man, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Daniel Daly, Retroversion.com, House of the Ted, Dan Barlow Jr., Joel, and all of my other patrons. Yeah!